we're just excited that you're all here. Uh, and we have April Warfield joining us, which is really exciting. As always, we're going to start by a little rapid fire Q&A to get to know our expert today. So April, are you ready for this? Let's do it. Okay, now I'm gonna do something different uh, than normal. I'm gonna mix it up. We're gonna crowdsource some good questions from the people who are in attendance. So I have a couple that we'll start with, but if you have a good, funny, ridiculous question for April, throw it in the chat and and we'll, we'll ask as many as we can get through. But first things first, uh, Miss, Miss April. Are you ready? I am. Okay, do you have any secret talents? Hmm. I don't know if it's secret, I sing. Oh, you know what? I, I have started making cards, handmade cards. Making cards. cards. Yes. And For like birthdays, anniversaries? Yeah. Cards. And so they're becoming quite the item in my family. Quite the I've, item. I have been told no more Hallmark cards from me. <laughs> done that's awesome <laughs> it's been fun that's pretty great okay here we go here we go first one from the audience go to starbucks drink oh caramel macchiato hot or cold hot we'll or cold mm -hmm. hot when you're in minnesota cold when you're in la yes <laughs> all right we got brandon from or no uh NLEFC favorite smell? I think flowers, maybe roses in particular. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty my normal. Name is, my name is April Rose. And so I do have an affinity for roses. Very it's good. Nothing like a rose. Uh, okay, Kirsten King, last good book you read? You know, Kirsten, I read a book. And I think it's called Jump. And it was about a gentleman who is now an executive at Nike, but early in life uh, was a felon. And it just talked about his journey of trying to keep the secret for so many years and the process that he went through to, to release that to the world. And uh, I enjoyed that. Wow. <clears throat> That's fascinating. It's called Jump? Yes. Oh, the questions are coming in fast. We're going to keep going real quick. If you could be any type of tree, Amy Becker wants to know what type of tree you would be. Yikes, Amy. I'm, I'm a city girl, so I'm going to go with Christmas tree. <laughs> That's nice. Christmas is nice. Green. Okay, who is the most famous person you've met? Living in LA, I've met a lot of famous people. Um, I want to say Shaquille O'Neal, meeting him was a lot of fun. He's just so normal. Um, Bruce Willis was another. Come on. These are legitimately famous people. These are legit famous people. That was, that was a good question. Okay. Favorite thing to do in your free time? Um probably read read and shop if i'm feeling like home you know being settled at home it would be reading but if i want to get out i love them all yeah so that's, be shopping. that's pretty good uh okay so what, what we're gonna do now is i have a few more questions for you before i dive into those i want to continue to welcome the news people that keep blogging on and christina my assistant is gonna share a poll and it would be awesome if you guys would uh, answer the question to this poll, what percentage of your youth come from outside of your church family? We'll circle back to this during the Q&A time. It'll be one of our first questions we address. But for now, we just want to see, uh, see your answers come in. So feel free to answer that poll as we continue. Okay, rapid fire questions are continuing. Uh, I have one of my own that I'm, that I'm interested in. How do you start your day? Like, what's the process? Hmm. You know, I almost always start my day with a cup of coffee. So the I alarm goes kinda, off and you go make a cup of coffee. That's I how it starts. I do. It really does. And what's special about that for me is that I have mugs that I've received as gifts. And so sometimes I will choose the mug based on my connection to someone. So 
I feel like I want to have coffee with my mother. I'll drink from a mug that she's gifted me. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. Every day I start with coffee or tea, but mostly coffee. Uh, okay, we'll do, we'll see if we can do one or two more here. What's one of the most interesting foods you've ever eaten? I was most afraid of that question because I'm not a very adventurous eater. I stick to tried and true. Um, okay. I'll say, I, I, you know, I took a trip to the Philippines and there were some things that I ate there that I still don't know what it was, you know, just be, being gracious. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not very adventurous in the food department. Okay, how about, how about this? You're having Shaquille O'Neal and Bruce Willis over for dinner. What do you cook? Okay, I am going to cook a homemade chicken pot pie. And I will make the dough from scratch and I will bake the chicken and assemble it all for them. I will also for dessert probably have a bread pudding with um, a custard caramel drizzle on top. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty nice. And then you'll send them home with a nice card. Thank you for coming. Or yes, really. yes, nice handmade <laughs> card. Okay, we got to squeeze in one more question because this just came in the chat and it's really ridiculous. So I'm going to ask it. If you had to get a tattoo of a food item uh, to scale, and when you show your tattoo, you get that food item free for the rest of your life. What do you get and where? I don't know how this, how, Ellie, I don't know how you thought of this question. I don't. I love her mind, though. I think it would be an apple fritter donut from Randy's, which is a famous donut place here in L.A. Okay. So you're just going to have the apple fritter. I just the would have an apple fritter. And show it off. That's pretty great. Okay, so folks, this I know normally it's rapid fire Q and A, and if you're used to these webinars, then we move into uh, an introduction of April and some housekeeping tools. But we have a special treat for you today, which is that uh, the president of the Evangelical Free Church of America is joining us, and so I want to invite Kevin on now. Kevin, if you want to come on the screen and I just wanted to give the floor to him because I think he has some encouragements for you all as you do the awesome work of making disciples of the next generation so Kevin the floor is yours oh Justin thank you very much let me tell you April uh, thank you I love learning some of those things <laughs> about you it's wonderful I, I want to just first of all say to all of you who are investing so much of yourselves in your ministry to students I just want to tell you thank you you know, I was reminded as I was reflecting on uh, my time with you today of what the Apostle Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, where he told them, I, we loved you. I loved you so much that I not only shared the gospel with you, but I shared my very life with you. And, and that's a significant part of doing student ministries. I mean, I, I think back to my own life. In fact, I was, uh, I was in dialogue about two weeks ago uh, with one of my high school friends. And we were emailing back and forth to each other. And he, uh, he, he has taught at Denver Seminary for years. And we were both kind of reminiscing about our high school days and days in student ministry and the significant impact that had on our lives. And I'm here to tell you uh, a good bit of who I am today in my walk with Christ is because of the people that invested in my life when I was in junior high and senior high in those young adult years. Um, one of whom was, uh, was a high school science teacher. Uh, I grew up in a small church in a small town in Northwest Minnesota. And uh, we, we had a high school science teacher named Wally who invested in us. He's the one who taught me how to study the scriptures, how to teach it, how to lead a Bible study. He taught me how to lead events. And I was on the phone with him about three weeks ago. He's almost 90 years old. And he's still teaching me stuff. And he still invests in my life. But a significant part of who I am and who my friend Larry is, is because we had people like you who loved us and invested in our lives and, and not just taught us, but lived life with us. Um, I think my, my friend Wally, he used to invite us over to his house Friday and Saturday nights in his basement. 
playing pool, watching TV, listening to music. And he had three little kids and he just invited us into his home to do life with him. It was a significant part of that kind of investment. Uh, the other thing that, that I think back on, and, and I'm, I hope many of you are going to be able to be a challenge this year. And I plan to, Becky and my wife, Becky and I are going to be there for uh, the last half of challenge for sure. And I hope to see you. In fact, if you're going to be a challenge, do me a favor, put your name in the chat because I want to meet you. I want you to come up and say hi to me if you're a challenge because it's those kind of investments that you make with students not just the week of challenge, but the follow-up to that that make a major difference. I was telling Justin uh, when we were chatting uh, yesterday or something, I think just in prep for this, that uh, I went to the precursor of challenge to tell you how long ago that was. That was in, I started going to what was then FCYF National Youth Conference. I started going in 1971. And I remember the year when we went over a thousand students. And we were all excited. We had over a thousand students at Challenge. Well, my wife Becky took students to Challenge when she was doing youth ministry in Deerfield, Illinois, when we first met when I was in seminary. All my kids have gone to Challenge. Their lives were changed. Ours. So I encourage you, if you're not, if, if you haven't signed up yet, sign up and go. If you are, come and see me when we're there, Becky, and I'd love to meet you. And thank you for caring enough about the lives of students that you not only invest the gospel in their lives, you invest your life in their lives because disciple making truly is life on life, learning to walk together so that more people would come to know Jesus and more of those students would become more like him. Bless you. Thanks for what you do. And Justin, thanks for the opportunity just to come in and say thanks and hopefully be a little of encouragement to you during some of these crazy days and crazy time. Keep doing what you're doing because it makes a difference. And someday, some old guy, and I, I can say I'm old now, I turned 65 eight days ago. Some old nice. guy like me somewhere down the road will look back and say, a lot of who I am today is because you invested the gospel in your life and their lives. Mm -hmm. Thanks for what you do. Kevin, I appreciate those words of encouragement for these folks that we love dearly, but it's it's pretty awesome to also know like, you're leading, you know, from your position in the EFCA and you also care about the next generation is really encouraging. So thank you That's for great. joining us. You're welcome. Love to be on these calls with you. Thanks for letting me join you. It's great. And now we get to listen to our dear friend, April. Although I'm like, maybe we should cancel this and have April go make some pot pie for everybody. And that sounds pretty good too. But uh, so let me officially introduce you, April. Okay, give me that honor. So it's really fun to have April with us today because she is not only an expert in what she's going to talk about, I'm excited for what she'll be sharing, but she's also my friend and coworker at the National Office for the FCA. And uh, she has a long list of really great accomplishments. So I'm going to read some of them. I'll brag about her for a little bit. She's been with the FCA for a long time. She knows about. Uh, 97% oh, of the people in the EFCA. And uh, I think after three years in my role as student ministries, I'm up to like 6% of the people in the EFCA. So I have some years, years to go. But uh, April serves now in with our all people's team. And prior to that, she actually served with Apex Missions, uh, which is the EFCA's next generation leadership pipeline. So she has uh, some bona fides as it relates to youth ministry as well. She was the director of US projects. And so she was developing strategic partnership, partnerships with churches and urban nonprofits and community-based organizations to help them train disciple makers and have students grow in relationship with Jesus. Um, but she also has served on a number of boards and task forces, the Women's Task Force, uh, Urban and Student Ministry, so she's lent her expert, expertise and experience across a ton of EFCA stuff. She is just um, one of us. And uh, I don't know, I'm honored to do this ministry alongside you, April. So I am going to let you take it away in just a second. Before I do that, I have just, if you've been on this call before, I think many of you have, a lot of the names are familiar, but here's just a few housekeeping things. One, please ask questions. Utilize the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask questions because the latter half of our call will just be us in a Q&A dialogue with April. So use that. And as you see questions come in, make sure to upvote the ones that you really want to see 
answered. You can hit a thumbs up on that and we'll make sure those uh, ones get answered. You can use the chat to communicate with us and each other and that's great. If it's possible, make sure that your full name is displayed and uh, that helps us as we do our giveaways. So if it's your church name and for some reason you can't uh, change it, just go ahead and put who's watching in the chat. And if there's multiple of you, let us know that too, because we uh, want to make sure that you're all invested in the giveaways. Speaking of the giveaways, we'll do our normal book giveaways at the end of this call, but today is the day. We are giving away two registrations to Renewal Conference. Uh, Renewal is a four-day, three-night conference focused on re renewal and sustaining you and your spouse as you do this ministry for the next generation. I think it's one of the most impactful things we do. Um, I hope you can join us and uh, we're excited to give two of those away at the end of this call. All right, April, I've rambled on long enough. Give the people <laughs> your expertise. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, Justin has invited me to discuss the topic of creating a, welcome, a welcoming culture. And I would like to do that by starting with um, a story. Prior to my time in the EFCA, I attended a church in Los Angeles, California, where we became aware of the plight of youth in foster care in the US. And that has just been an ongoing public health crisis for our country. And um, you know, at that time, there were over half a million children in the foster care system. And, 30,000 of them lived in Los Angeles County. And where I lived and attended church was in a district that had the highest percentage of kids in foster care in the county. And so with that, we were led um, to develop a youth ministry focused on engaging teens in foster care. And so after many years of youth ministry inside the walls of the church, um, we had to rethink what a welcoming culture might look like outside the walls of the church. And as is true with most new ventures, this new venture into um, youth ministry was very chaotic. Um, we had volunteers who, with lots of love and goodwill and were committed to sharing the gospel and skilled professionals that were all prepared to engage students as they aged out of the foster care sister system. And, um, you know, and quite honestly, you guys, uh, the ministry remained a little chaotic until we were able to flesh out what a welcoming culture looked like in that context. Uh, we were not able to, we didn't think this would be the case, but I think we had to be really intentional and persistent in creating a culture that was welcoming to this group and um, not lean on what we knew what was true of engaging youth in the church. And so here we are engaging students um, from environments that are fraught with chaos and brokenness. And we had to learn how to love them into reframing what it meant to accept a welcoming culture. That was key. And so early on in our planning, of course, we discussed our organizational culture and we understood that to be the collection of values and expectations and practices that guide and inform our action as a team. In short, our culture would just, you know, would be the environment that we would create for living out our mission and our vision. And so, you know, we did that work ahead of time and we knew that our culture would impact how we do ministry. And so for you, I would just like to pose the question, what are some of the values in your ministry? Maybe you can just drop that in, in the chat. Is that there a high value on alignment or innovation or trust? For us, it was important that we reflect the value of love, structure and order. And lastly, we valued the equipping that they that they would need to transition into adulthood. So our values were love, structure, order, and equipping for transition into um, adulthood. And so the foundation of our ministry ethos was grounded in the great commandment and the great commission. 
I believe our highest value as Christian leaders is our obedience to fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission. Um, in Matthew 22, Jesus gives us our marching orders that we are to love the Lord our God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment and second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And equally as important is the great commission in Matthew 28 go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the basis of our culture, the culture that we wanted to develop, to develop in our ministry was based on loving God and loving our new neighbors and making disciples of all nations. And as it relates to culture, we know as leaders, you know, as leaders, the leader sets the tone and assumes responsibility for culture. And that's whether positive or negative, we set the tone. And so as our team and our students uh, see us pursuing Jesus and loving him, so they will do the same. And if they see negative uh, reinforcement of behavior, that will, you know, per permeate through our group as well. It's an unescapable truth that we're responsible for setting the tone of the culture. And so back to you, uh, earlier you dropped in a couple of values. Why don't you give us a thumbs up on a thumbs down that would reflect if you're seeing your values lived out in your group or is it a work in progress for you? And this is just meant to be an encouragement for others on the call. When developing a welcoming culture, we have to consider our values, missions, and expectations. They must be clarified as more than a plan, but something we can live into. And I'm sure most of us have heard uh, Peter Drucker's famous statement, or at least he's credited with it, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And we learned this very quickly in our ministry. Um, in, in the early days, our students controlled the culture. No, no, you know, there was no doubt that they were in control of the culture. And, you know, we did all the things, right? We curated and created curriculum and raised funds and recruited people, yet we didn't account for the fact that students were not emotionally equipped to receive the love we offered. And we didn't imagine didn't have the foresight to see how that might impact the environment. Um, for some of the teens, this was the first time they had ever been cared for by someone who had nothing to gain from investing in them. And of course, when they showed up as all good leaders, we had our rules of engagement, you know, our cult, and, and, but I can honestly say that our culture began to shift we when we included our teens in developing the rules of engagement. And what we learned is that, you know, a welcoming culture is objective. It depends on the people being welcomed into the space. And so allowing them to have a voice um, in shaping the culture was significant to our ministry. And so with you, you know, including your teams and your students and parents, will be essential to developing this culture in your group. And so, you know, I would recommend inviting parents into cultural conversations and they will be your advocates. Um, hopefully at home, they'll reinforce what you're training. But also as they're engaging parents in your community and parents in your church, as they share the culture and the vision for the ministry, um, hopefully you'll have students that come prepared to align with the culture. Another essential would be to recruit for the culture you'd like to project. Build a team of spirit-led adults who are attracted to the culture and will help move your ministry forward. Um, not every volunteer is a fit for your ministry. And I know it's difficult to turn down help. We all need more support in our ministries, but sometimes it's absolutely necessary in order to maintain the culture. 
And in our ministry, we recognize that the um, teens connected best with college-aged volunteers. And so with that, we uh, had to limit the number of adults in the space. The adults just bought a very different energy. Um, and so the adults that were volunteering with us needed to shift their attention from the teens to the college students. And that was a big shift for some of them. And, and for some, it just wasn't a fit and they weren't able to be a part. But we saw, you know, the biggest value for us was encouraging our students and preparing them to transition well and maintaining the culture that was a fit for that for them. And then the last um, element of creating a welcoming culture that I'd like to share with you is providing a safe, grace-filled space for conflict, healing, and transformation. And this is true whether your ministry is inside or outside the walls of the church, conflict will happen. But often when we think of a welcoming culture, we envision something peaceful, something passive, you know, a passive environment. But I, I would submit that welcoming cultures are not devoid of conflict. And I can think of uh, several ministry stories, um, you know, that will share this point, but instead I'd like to look to scripture and Jesus's encounter with the woman uh, at the well, the Samaritan woman in John 4. And um, I think this illustrates a safe, grace-filled space with conflict, healing, and transformation. I believe it uh, illustrates that point very well. And so this is a very familiar um, account for most of us. Jesus is on his journey from Judea back to Galilee, and he's tired and sits at a well at noon and a Samaritan woman comes to draw water and he asked her for a drink and she's taken aback in her response and asked, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? You see, she was very aware of the cultural differences that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. She was also aware that there was conflict between their people. They actually hated one another. And there was, it was also problematic that Jesus would be at the well alone with this woman. And so they discussed these differences in their religious beliefs and the, account, the encounter could have ended there. When we engage people who are different from us, Oftentimes, we don't get beyond our differences. But a welcoming Jesus offered her living water, said, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. And the conversation, the exchange between them continues, and, and then Jesus brings up the, you know, the issue of her having a husband, and she told a half-truth. And, um, and I would imagine that this was an issue of shamefulness for this woman. And probably the reason that brought her to the well at noon um, alone. And um, what I, as I read this encounter, what I continue to see is that his engagement with the Samaritan woman was not a passive encounter. And so similarly to this woman, our students are dealing with painful issues, shameful circumstances, and a lack of theological clarity to meet these needs. And Jesus didn't abandon her or withdraw from her. That's what's key to me, is that he stayed in relationship with her. He offered healing for her soul in this space. Instead of withdrawing, he leaned in 
in a way that let her know that he sees her. He extends himself. He removes any doubt about who he is. He goes, scripture goes on to say, uh, Jesus says, I am he. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. He revealed to her himself as a healer for her soul. And so our purpose, as we lead our ministries, our purpose in grounding our ministry in the great commandment and the great commission is to see transformation. And this woman's belief in Jesus brought transformation and not just for her. He won her, but her, through her testimony, scriptures say many of the Samaritans from that village committed themselves to him and they proclaimed him as savior of the world. And friends like Jesus, we too can offer welcoming spaces that address conflict, that address differences in gender and differences in abilities and economic differences and racial differences as well. But also we have the ability to offer healing with the gospel, the love of God and others through the great commandment. And Jesus modeled and equipped us to pursue those with differences. He equipped us and modeled that, that for us and commissioned us to do it. You know, I'll, I'll just, as I um, wrap up, we set the tone. As leaders, we set the tone for our ministry culture. And the disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand why Jesus was engaging the Samaritan woman. And he taught them. He later taught them. And sometimes your volunteers and your students and parents may need more training and engagement in order to embrace the culture that God has placed on your heart. And I would just encourage you to, to take the time to invest. We're all striving for a welcome culture, a welcoming culture in our churches and in our ministries, but not only for the sake of fun for our kids or a sense of belonging for our kids, we desire to see transformation that brings multiplication as it did with the Samaritan woman. And so my prayer for you is that you'll develop a welcoming culture where you're known for loving God and loving others. A culture that positions you to make disciples of any and every person God sends through your doors. That's my prayer for you today, my friends. Justin, I will turn it over to you. That was a beautiful way. That was a beautiful way to end it. Can you say that sentence again, that last one? your prayer my prayer is that you highlight that yeah you'll develop a welcoming culture where you're known for loving god and loving others a culture that positions you to make disciples of any and every person god sends through your doors mm. amen amen that's what i aspire to yeah i you mean know? that is it's a beautiful picture, but it's also like, and I'm sure all these youth workers can attest to it. When we see glimpses of it, when we see glimpses of people who like, they wouldn't normally hang out, but they're coming around this thing because God is doing something in their heart. Yes. They're coming together. That's a, that's a powerful thing. So we have a lot of questions in the Q&A box. If you haven't uh, looked at it, you can click on that Q&A box. Even if you haven't put in a question, and you can upvote the ones you want to see answered, a lot of them uh, in there already. And so let's just start uh, with the poll, though. Let's start by going back to that survey that we took. And we asked you guys, uh, what percentage of your youth come from outside of your church family? Now, most people were in the 15 to 30 percent, 30 percent range. Uh, do, do any of these things, does any of this surprise you, April? 
you know, it does in a way, um, because I was reading some data recently and there was um, Dr. Michael Emerson made the statement that the average congregation is significantly less diverse than their neighborhood and local school, which would say to me that those kids are not present, but it sounds from the poll that people are coming, students are coming from the outside mm -hmm. of this church circle to engage. I wonder too, if there's some, um, some reality that younger people might be more open to like showing up to a youth group event than maybe adults in the community would be to randomly showing up at a church service. Uh, I, I actually am really curious for the, you don't have to share if you don't feel comfortable for those five of you that are like 45 percent plus it would be really interesting i think for the rest of us to hear what has caused that because that's a really cool thing that there's some inroads to the community being made um by youth ministry but while while we wait for some of those things to come in the chat here's here's some of the questions that we that we got uh you you mentioned a little bit about this when you talked about engaging parents in the in the ministry, but uh, we have another question along the same lines, which is how do we help the larger church be more welcoming of students? And I have personally heard youth workers share with me and experienced it in youth ministry of like, sometimes parents are more hesitant of the kids who are coming in from the outside than your students are. And so how do you navigate that? What advice could you give our youth leaders? You know, I think that keeping your parents engaged um, as often and communicating with them about what's happening in the youth group is probably the best way to um, allay the fears. Parents are operating out of fear, right? They're operating in the unknown. Who are these kids, right? They don't know the parents. They're so used to being familiar with the parents of their kids' friends. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, also, having the support of your leadership, your church leadership, I've seen that as vital to um, ministries that have been able to engage students from the community. And, um, and it's not easy. It's, you know, it's a long haul um, because we, we just have become accustomed in our churches, we become accustomed to students who were raised there who understand the culture, who, you know, we're used to their shenanigans, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And now we get this new group of kids that are, you know, that are not aware of the culture and appear to be acting out, but sometimes are just not, are unaware. So I think there's education on the part of the students that are coming from the outside, helping them to understand, respect the culture of the church but also educating parents and getting the buy-in of your leadership. And like you, you know, like you, I've, I've heard of churches where, you know, the youth group open their doors to kids from other cultures and it just, it hasn't bode well. And some of that, in my opinion, has been the leader's inability to have conflict right to resolve conflict with these kids. And they are like, we want a welcoming environment, which is passive and pleasant. But sometimes that welcoming environment is saying, we don't do that here. We love you and you're welcome here, but this is not what we do. Sure. And that's not yeah. unwelcoming or not, or, or a lack of love. It's helpful for the student to understand how to engage in the context. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things you mentioned was making sure leadership is engaged. And obviously, I think we understand that at a volunteer leader level, but uh, but even as like your, your senior pastor level can be really helpful. One time, one of my very first nights as a middle school pastor, one sixth grader threw his twin brother sixth grader into a wall and made a sixth grader sized dent in the wall right this is like my first year and I gotta go to our executive pastor and say hey here's what happened you know and his response was well it sounds like you had a great night of youth group like that sounds good 
like people are having fun mm-hmm. and <laughs> wrestling and whatever it sounds normal okay what that did for me though was it really brought my fear down of like we can create an atmosphere here that's not uh it doesn't have to look a certain way like we we can do things and 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 allow space for students to be themselves now obviously I didn't want WWE breaking out every sure. of youth group but what it did was it conveyed to me that it was more important that those students felt welcomed in the room than that the room stayed clean and organized Sure. And I agree with you. If you can engage your leadership in such a way where they they buy into that vision too, that you're trying to make disciples and that process is going to create mess and it's going to create dents in the wall in a variety of ways, you know, mm-hmm. that's a beautiful thing. Okay, I've talked way too much. I want to ask you this question. And uh, it's it's really interesting. What What's something you've learned in your actions with multi, in your interactions with multi-ethnic churches or second language congregations? That could help. Uh, that could help people create a welcoming atmosphere in their youth group. I think, and this may be a bit odd, but I think in multi-ethnic churches and um, second language service churches, sometimes we miss the opportunity to engage the family. Oftentimes, these students come from communities that's very family oriented, not that other communities aren't, but in a, in a different way, right? And mm-hmm. so um, just having a kid in your group and never engaging the family, what if the family doesn't come to church? How do you make yourself available to the parents? How do you gain the trust of the parents as you're engaging their students? And I, I just think that's the biggest miss that I've seen um, when students are joining um, in, in multicultural environments, or especially when it's a majority cultural environment and you're beginning to attract minority students. Yeah, yeah. I think in, engaging their families, whether they're a part of the church or not, has to be a priority. Mm. So that's the only way you'll be able to build trust. So what does it look like then, if I can just follow up, like what, what, what have you seen that's been like these people, when you say engaging the families, they're doing it well. That's a good uh, sure. example or practical thing. Sure. Um, I've seen youth pastors who have, well, you know what? Okay, I'll go with an example here in California. Um, there was a, a pastor and his family who moved into a new church and without taking time to invest in the families and understand the culture of the, um, the community, they started inviting people over for dinner. Mm. And which for them was what you do when you enter a new context, you invite people in. And someone from the community educated them that we, that feels like a handout to us, right? Us mm-hmm. coming to you feels like a handout. We will come if you will allow us to bring dinner. And so that leader was very, he was uncomfortable, right? Having people bring him food, but that was his way into honoring that community. So just understanding the culture that you're navigating. Um, and and it, it takes, being uncomfortable it takes missteps it happens but that's the only way that we'll be able to um draw families in and gain the trust of of parents in this context that's a powerful statement if we're going to be leaders that create these kind of cultures we have to be willing to be uncomfortable so absolutely. someone else can be comfortable absolutely and that you know often we flip that right We live for our comfort. We do what's comfortable for us. We do what's familiar. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to hear a different voice is very significant. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right, this is a unique question. I think it's fascinating. John Gardner, I just give you props. This question is amazing. It's one of my favorite we've ever had. How do you lovingly welcome introverts without expecting them to become extroverts? 
And I don't love it because I'm an introvert. You know, that's not me. But I, I know there, there are a lot of people that are introverts. And, like, our version of welcoming can be, like, come be an extrovert with us so yeah. we know you feel welcomed, you know? Yeah. I think one of the ways to do that is to, um, you know, as you're assessing your group, perhaps assign the way you assign leaders to follow up with kids. I know a lot of youth ministries have a small group structure. And so, you know, if that's the case, being mindful of where you place kids, they are who they are. And we want to honor who they are. We don't want to change them, but we want to be aware of who they are and create um, an environment within the larger group that allows them an opportunity to grow and thrive and, and grow in their love for Jesus. That's what he would do, right? Meet them where they are. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got, a, we got another um, one here. It, how, how do we balance shepherding the kids we have and doing community engagement at a local school or program? Because schedules are busy. It maybe seems overwhelming for youth leaders to be like, you should be in the, you should be in the school, you know, you should be. It's like, what would you say to, the, to this question? You know, if it were me, my priority would be to the group in my church. I mean, if that's who you're hired to serve, you know, so there to disciple them, you know, has to be the priority. And if that is the case where if you're feeling stressed, then oftentimes your students will let you know that they are feeling like they're not being considered. That's, you know, I've had that conversation with youth leaders where, you know, we've had a youth group for a number of years and then students from the community begin to join us and they overtake the space. So, you know, with this very different culture, that's one of the reasons that we chose um, to have a youth ministry specifically outside of the walls of the church and not try to blend the two. And so I would, you know, make the, the priority the students that you're shepherding and to whatever degree you can engage in community engagement or help, or your families can join or your students can join in that, then it can be an opportunity for ministry with your students. Mm and view alongside it that way. your students yeah. Like yes. yeah, yeah so that you're not spread so thin and then you're teaching them how to engage people outside of the church yeah. okay. all right well, let's make this the last question it got a lot of of both so uh what is one practical way we can make our church more welcoming to students something basic we could do this week maybe I think one practical thing would be to remind, if your vision and, and your mission of your church is one um, that's, you know, you're, you want to be welcoming and that's already the language and the verbiage that you do, the one that you have, the one practical thing would be to remind everyone of the mission. I think mm. that sometimes we assume that everybody understands the mission, that everybody is clear on what we value. And so I think, you know, just one practical thing would be to remind people that this is what we're about and encourage them to take a step in that direction. And so that may mean for some bringing someone, but for another group that might mean just being open to the introvert and be, be you know, interested in the introvert. So I believe the one one thing that you can do is just to remind people of your values yeah. and then encourage them to go. Is that two things? What? Remind and encourage. No, I think, that's, I think it's really good. It's almost convicting. I like I look back at my time uh, leading leading youth ministry and oftentimes I'd be like, well, the leaders heard that at the leader meeting at the beginning of the year. You know, they heard my mission then. But to your point, it's like, we all need to hear mission over and over and over again. Yeah. So I and I think, I think we do it when things aren't going well. We remind yeah. ourselves of the mission. We encourage ourselves in the mission. But what if we made that central, even when things are going really well, this is why we do what we do. Yeah. Amen. So that would be my one thing. Amen. Uh, I did hear from a youth worker, and I wish I could remember 
this, see, this is horrible. I want to give them credit. So credit to this anonymous person in my memory who said they encourage their leaders. This is really interesting. They do, they, they caught like 10, three and one. So they're like, say hi to 10 kids, uh, learn something new about three kids and pray with one kid every night of your, your Wednesday night or your Sunday night or whatever. That's, that's like really sweet. simple. That and is, something to yeah. hold on to. But very um, attainable. All right. It's uh that was great, April. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Justin. So much for that. I uh I'm gonna move, move us. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna move us to our giveaway time. So you should get excited about this, April. You get the wheel of names. Okay. Can I win? And uh, but before we do that, I actually have can you win? Well, this is interesting. Kevin Complin, our, our dear president of the EFCA, he won last time he joined the call or last year he won and we did not give him the prize. We oh, okay. to give it to another leader. So I'm going to treat, I'm going to treat you the same way. Since you're the expert, you don't need the resource. Okay. Okay. Uh, but before, before we do that, I have good news, which is, um, so I think many of you might know this, but some of you might not. We have this thing called the reach students newsletter. Basically it's an email newsletter that we send out about once a month. And if you're not signed up for these, I would encourage you to sign up for them. Christina is going to put uh, a link in the chat that you can click on to sign up. And basically, we send out the latest studies in Gen Z, information about EFCA events and training opportunities and conferences and retreats. We even highlight helpful icebreaker games and studies and resources. Um, and we just try to make it as helpful as possible. Uh, something in your inbox that can sharpen you as a youth leader. We're gonna send one out at 4 p.m. Central today. So if you sign up right after this call, you will you can expect it in your inbox then. And included in this month's newsletter is this really interesting study on words that young people like and dislike. So they take words, I mentioned this to you earlier, April, when we were talking about some challenge conference stuff, but there's, um, yeah. Like, how do young people view the word patriotism? How do young people view the word justice? And it's really fascinating what they found. So that's going to be included. But OK, I can't see anything or hear anything. But I'm going to talk and trust that you all can hear me. And Kevin and April, you can let, you can let me know if they can't hear anything, OK? Sounds good. OK, but we are also going to give away uh, in this newsletter, you can use a, the link at the bottom and be entered for one of the challenge crew necks. I'm actually wearing it today. I have no idea if you can see me. My whole computer screen is black. So I'm just trusting in faith that you can see this. But if not, it's a beautiful challenge crew neck. So if you sign up for the newsletter now, it's going to go out at 4 p.m. Check your inbox. Make sure it didn't go to a spam folder. And then click that link at the, at the bottom um, and you'll be able to enter your name for a giveaway of the crew neck. Okay, so it is time for our giveaways. And today we are gonna give away three copies of a book that for me personally has just been super impactful as I think about hospitality. And it's this book by Rosaria Butterfield called Gospel Comes with a House Key. I, maybe you've heard about it. I think it's convicting, it is beautifully written and it's powerful. So we're, we're gonna give away three copies of the Gospel Comes with a House Key. And Christina, you can share your screen and start doing those um, giveaways. April, I am going to let you host this very exciting Wheel of Names giveaway time. And I'm going to try to log off and log back on, okay? I'll be back in 30 seconds, hopefully. So we have a winner, Tyler McNewson. I'll probably have a question mark at, at the end of every name. So Tyler is the winner of the crew neck. Who's next, Christina? Well, Jennifer Kami. Tyler actually won one of the books. Um, so did Jennifer won last week as well. So, you know, Yay, we got a double winner on our hands. And the third book is going to, oh no, is it Carson? 
<laughs> Way to go, Carson. All right, those are our three book winners. And I wish Justin was here for the, the great reveal of who won the renewal registrations. We are giving away two renewal registrations and I've compiled everyone's names who has been on these calls and your name every time. So there are 239 names on this wheel of names right now. Um, it looks a little crazy, but yeah, drum roll, please. This is our first renewal giveaway happening right now. I'm so curious. Congratulations, Nathan. You are our first renewal registration winner. I'll contact you and get you all signed up for free. Our second renewal registration is going to, got to jot these down. Christy Hurley, congratulations. Hopefully you all will be able to make it this November and I will follow up with all of you on that. Anyways, I don't think we have Justin back on the call, call quite yet, but that wraps up our training series. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, April. It was thank a joy you. to have you. Thanks, it was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this was the last one of 2022. And so we uh, will start up training series next January. Um, but sign up for the newsletter to stay in contact. And I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Tina. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.